All right, so I've got a brush, but it's really boring. So I'm in the brush settings under window, and I'm taking this customized brush that I brought in, and I'm going to make it based on pin pressure. So the lighter I press, the smaller it is, the harder I press, the bigger it is. That helps. Next, I'm going to change the size jitter so that it's not always the exact same rhythm, right? And that will look more manual as well. I can play with a minimum diameter that's not super tiny, and that can be helpful. And then really most importantly, and I'll show this really big so you can see, so my brush <laughs> is only ever showing at one angle until I play with the angle jitter. Now with, with better tablets, with more expensive tablets, tablets that cost more than $60, you can control the angle jitter with the tilt of your stylus. And so I might as well put that in, but unfortunately uh, my pen doesn't have that capability. But if you just put an angle jitter in, it will give that impression that it will change angle each time. You see how, that's why I like to build directionality into the brush. So each time I press, it'll be a slightly different angle, which helps it not look so mechanical. The, the other thing I'll use when I'm doing my beginning painting, like I will here, is you might put a little bit of scattering on. And you can base your scatter just on pin pressure as you normally do, but keep the count down low. That way, when I press hard, it will fill up a lot of space really quickly. Okay. So I've defined my brush. Don't forget your brush options at the top, mainly the size and the opacity. Right? Don't play too much with the mode, otherwise you'll get really confused about how your brush is working. And I like my brush to be about the size of a pencil eraser, right? But now that it's pressure sensitive, if I don't touch very hard, it will be pretty darn teeny. Yeah, so I don't want it to get much smaller than that, but if I push harder because of the scatter, it will fill up a lot of space quickly. Now that's all at 100% opacity. Check out what happens. This is still just with black. Check out what happens if I take that down to like a 60% opacity, which is how I'll do most of my painting. Then you see where it overlaps. I get nice value variation. And there's a nice hand done organic quality to those brush strokes. So that's why I am in favor of you customizing your brush. Now you can find lots of brushes online that do similar things, but it's always good to know how to make it for yourself. Okay, now I've already got this reference. I don't need that right now. Instead, I'm gonna use my color script reference and start blocking in on top of my sketch. And I'm gonna do it at about um, 62%. And I'm gonna use the brush tool. Now this is what I love about Photoshop. As long as I'm in Photoshop, I can hold down option and steal colors from anywhere. So if I want that color, I can use it. If I want this color, I can use it. If I want this color, I can use it. So on and so on. Now the reason I'm only painting at 60% is so I can see my sketch underneath. And I can play with it. And because I'm stealing from a watercolor, I'm already getting kind of that palette and those variations in value that are suggesting kind of the watercolor feel I want this to have by the end. That doesn't mean I can't make some stronger color choices and some strong edges. Notice I'm not zoomed in, I'm not working on detail. 
but I will kind of frame the eyes a little bit carefully. And I like this color reference because it's got a lot more color variations than the swatches in Photoshop. And it's even more experimental than I'm probably going to go. People forget the importance of browns when they're painting. You'll see there's not a lot of browns in the in the swatches. They're down at the very bottom. They look really dead. But when you steal from actual paintings, like scans of paintings, and you do a lot of study of art, you'll see that most colors are either uh, colorful grays or browns pushed in different directions. So that's why it can be hard to just choose colors without clear reference. Now, where would the darkest dark be? So it looks like this eyelid on his head is the darkest dark. And what I, what I like to do sometimes is establish that with a palette on the side. What are the main colors I'm going to be using? You just do it off far enough to the side where it's really easy to delete them later. So I can steal colors from my color script or my color reference, but I can also steal them from my little palette on the side. The challenge is to keep your actual painting as large as possible. You're not required to do a background, so don't worry about that. So I'm going to sh shrink this a little bit. I'm going to work on this space so that I can hopefully have my reference off on each side. So I'm going to push that over there. Use the, uh, the navigator to frame up the face, maybe make it a little bit bigger. I'm using this reference for the values. And notice that photo isn't actually all that great. There's not a lot of gray value in his face because his jacket is so dark and the background is so dark. And his hair is just all blasted out. And then this one I'm really using for different colors. So I'm going to widen that out to the side. I'm going to try to stay just working on this one, floating on top. And at any time, I can zoom in really quickly with the navigator. And move that around when I want to get, start getting detailed. But that's a ways away. Right now, you can always do Command-0 just to fit it all on the screen. All right, how do you get the navigator? You go to Window. And you'll see that tool, and it's very helpful with the swatches. And this is just my default essentials view within uh, Photoshop CC 2018. Okay, so I'm going to stay on the brush throughout, but I want to make sure I know what layers I'm on. So I want to be careful. I have my sketch layer. This is my fixed sketch. And I want to be careful not to paint on that layer, so I'm going to lock it. I have my background layer, which really should just be a solid white. So I'm going to fill that with solid white. And I want to lock that. Right now, I'm doing my base color layer. If we look at that handout, it's kind of the local flat color, <laughs> except I'm not doing it realistically. I'm kind of filling in like this apple and trying to get rid of the white. And then on top of that, I have my little skeletal sketch, which maps the face. So I'll call it my face map. And this might be ha handy later. In fact, I'm going to change that to be a little bit darker. And I don't need it so colored. To get a nice touch of mortality. But I'm going to keep that turned off for now. 
as long as it's turned off, I'm not likely to ping panic. Okay, so I'm now on the phase which I call kill whitey. Let's see a little bit from here too when I want bolder color. So since he's more shaded on this side, I'm going to find shadow values I like. It's nice when you're doing it in a slightly lower opacity because then all the colors kind of mix and overlap. And I'm going to try to kind of set up his light source a little bit. So he has more shadow on this side of his face. And the mistake is to use too much of the same color all over the place. You are allowed to do a painting in monotone, you know, all in black and white, all in different blues. But you'll have a lot more fun really embracing the full color nature of digital painting. Some people like to digitally paint only with, with a grayscale and then add colors over the top. Almost like coloring a comic book. But I like to, to paint kind of full out. I, I try it multiple ways. If I'm going for something really realistic, I might do it just a value value study first. But if I stole colors from here and just painted with those, that would be incredibly dull. For me, at least. Okay, at any time, I can turn off my sketch and see what painting I have done so far. And the, your first goal should be to get rid of all of the white space. And one way I can actually keep myself to that is when I turn off my sketch, instead of having bright white, let me make a duplicate of that layer and fill this instead with middle gray. Usually I'll do this once I've established a darkest dark. And that will help me see because any whites I also have to paint. But I don't want solid white. I'm going to steal my whites from, from this source because white should have some color in it. Otherwise, according to the computer, it's just blank anyway. Now, by having a different color script for each of these paintings, each of these portraits, even though it's the same painter, me, doing them, they should each have kind of a unique take and personality. And I hope to give them slightly different edge qualities and traits as well. So he's got a heavy shadow in this eyebrow. I'm going to use green for that. Maybe use some of this beautiful Haynes gray dark turquoise with that green give some depth he's got a deep shadow inside his ear and then of course around his nose and then some of the wrinkles on his face now to get likeness in your painting and in your sketch and this isn't a portrait class or a caricature class so I'm not going to be grading you on how how accurate your likeness is, but it's not based on details. It's based on the placement of things. So I, I do a lot of squinting and kind of measuring uh, the spaces between features. That's a lot more important to making it look like the person you're trying to capture than drawing every eyelash that they have or getting every strangly eye, eyebrow. And I like to do people that have been uh, dead for a while, especially inspirational artists like George Bernard Shaw here, or inspirational public figures like Constance Mankiewicz. Because the photos are mostly black and white, 